Hello. So following Vincent's talk, um, my obsessions are music and technology, so this feels quite apt. Now, the meeting point in my mind of music and, and technology might be different from what you think it is. I'm convinced it's in pitch. It's in the perception of pitch. And music, technology have always met together and changed the way we hear and the way we interact with sound. So we often try to identify the best in class, you know, the, the most refined way of performing, the most refined way of sharing. And there are some interesting trends happening right now. I don't have anything to play for you today, I'm sorry. Um, I don't have anything to show from my own work. But I'm going to talk to you about a few ideas that interest and excite me right now. So we can define pitch very simply as, well, I'm taking this from the dictionary, so they can do it better, uh, the quality of sound governed by the rate of vibrations producing it. So no point is it saying an, you know, that A is 440 hertz. There's a very good reason for that. And I'll get into that shortly. The frequency that we refer to is an absolute. It's a constant and a fixed thing. 440 hertz, something either is or is not 440 hertz. Something either is or is not an A. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a different thing. Pitch and frequency are not linked in, in the real sense of the word. And she has a quick show of hands. Who, in Hannah's performance, who could have got a sense that that was a Chinese or an Eastern instrument without, without being told? Can anyone? So actually, most of you, right? Yeah. OK, pitch, pitch is a, has a real sense of identity. It's like a language. It's, it's more profound, I believe, than an accent. It gives you such a strong sense of, um, of cultural identity and, and legacy. But pitch has always been evolving, and it's got a very interesting checkered history. It's moved from this floating point that you, know, you just needed to sing your thing in your village, and you could do your own little thing in yours, and everyone was happy because no one knew any different. But the need for, for sharing and, and joining together brought a need for standardization. And in a more uh, sort of a glamorous first world kind of problematic way, the need for brilliance and shine and sparkle and, and better sound led to pitch ultimately getting sharper, getting brighter, more brilliant. It sounded better in halls, it looked better, you know, it felt better as an audience member, and it felt better as a performer. So, we've seen the standardization happen, but they started talking about it at ta in township level. But it wasn't until 1711, and this is not that long ago, really, that someone started to try and formalize this. And this was 1711, the tuning fork, which gives you a fixed reference point. It doesn't give you anything more. It gives you one note, and it was chosen to be an A. The need for this obviously comes from increased travel, the mobility of people. If they were traveling from London to Frankfurt, not only would it take them days, but when they got there, they needed some way of, of being able to share their music. So here we've got three. So those were six reference pitches, six notes from London from a hundred year period. So that was an A. We left, we finished with an A, 440 hertz, with completely bog standard daily concert pitch in, in the West, uh, except for continental Europe. They're a little bit tricky about that. But um, <laughs> standardization doesn't, doesn't always work. Uh, so that we ended up with 440, but started with the tuning fork at 423, which is, you know, a good, a good enough difference. We're talking, we are talking very fine levels. Um, so a lot of you might be wondering what, what the hell is the point? Like, what's the difference? If it's, you know, basically a semitone, what does that really do? Well, if you're a singer, right, and you're from London, and you're going to Paris, and you're singing, that makes it quite difficult. If you're singing, if you're singing the Queen of the Night, and you've, I think it's a top B flat, isn't it? The bit. Um, if your top note is a B flat in London, that might be a B natural in Paris, or it might, might be as high as a C in, in Frankfurt. You know, that, that means you can't actually sing. Like, that's quite a profound problem. And so what they found, singers started putting in their contracts what pitch they would sing at. Like, I just think this is amazing. People say, I will sing at A432 and no higher. Like, that's where I will sing. 
And you know, that's quite effective, that's quite interesting, it's quite fun. Um, but it wasn't really tenable till the international, this is absolutely true, the International Standards, uh, International Standards Organization in, what was this, 1936, so A440, standardized pitch at A440, following the French government actually making it a law that pitch would be at a certain thing and, and you know, contract being issued. The ISO jumped in and said, right, 440, fight it out yourselves. But it's not quite, again, it's not quite as simple as just having a reference pitch, because you've got, as we heard in Jennifer's performance, we heard in Hannah, we've seen in the pianos, there are millions of notes in between. How do you divide them up? How do you space them? And so there are a couple of quite important tuning systems that have uh, been created, that have been refined over time. So just temperament is rounded to fifths and octaves, so large, quite large intervals. And over the period of a piano, for example, that will get progressively worse in tuning. Mean tone, tuned in thirds, so you're narrowing and then well temperament and equal temperament in semitones. You're getting narrower and narrower bands of probability. So it gets more likely that it will be in tune. Um, but it, any musicians in, in the house will, will agree and will know that, say, a, a major third on a piano isn't quite right. It's not really, it's a bit fussy, but it's not quite right in fifths. It kind of depends on the key, and it's, they're temperamental things, and we're, we're really very sensitive to this. I mean, everyone is very sensitive to this. We happen to be able to articulate it in a particularly whiny and kind of tedious way. But, uh, you know, people are very sensitive to this. Uh, you know, the, the introduction of well temperament, um, common misconception that Bach wrote the well tempered clavier for equal temperament. It was actually well temperament. It's all in the title. Groves got it wrong. Well temperament it was. Um, that actually meant he could write for a fixed pitch instrument, as a piano or a harpsichord, he could write in any key, and that could all be played on one instrument. And that's quite a profound difference. That's a big deal in music terms, where you used to only be able to play in the keys that didn't have kind of dud intervals or, you know, that just didn't work, didn't sound right. Uh, well temperament meant one instrument, you can, you can kind of spread bet. You can do just about everything pretty, pretty well. So, that, again, is quite interesting, leading to the little canvas of you knowing it was, behind me, Chinese, a Chinese instrument. Um, and you would probably recognize the viola as a nominally Western thing, and a piano is basically Western. And our perception of pitch and tuning uh, is not based on perfection. It is based on experiences, like a language. We all speak, so in Britain, we've got, and we're obsessed with, language, in, with accents. We've all got a different accent. We all group it together as being and it was speaking in English. And you can translate between someone who's, you know, from up north and someone from down south and someone from Scotland, Ireland, Wales. Same global language, same content language, different front end, different accent. But the thing with tuning is that it's entirely relative. It depends on where you've come from, where you're going. So what note came before, what comes after, what goes on top, what goes underneath, what's playing alongside it. There are so many conditions. And that, that does throw up some interesting problems, that pitch is a fluid process. There isn't one true note. So an F sharp in D major, the third, will be quite bright. It'll be a raise, a leading interval. Whereas in B minor, it'll, it's the fifth, it'll be quite flat. But the name is the same, and if you play the two together, they'll sound wrong. If you play the, the, if you swap them over, it just won't feel quite right. And this is, uh, you know, you can't really do too much about that on a piano, but on a, as a, as a singer or as a cellist or a viola player, uh, we have this delightfully pretentious concept of expressive intonation. So deliberately playing out of tune, playing a little bit sharp, leading it, you know, just nudging something up or, or just sitting back on it, you know, to, to really get every ounce of, of expression out of every note. And you can, you can really, you know, listen to a great string quartet. It's the most incredible thing. You know, it's, it's not, or a great vocal quartet. You know, it's not mechanical. It's not bang, 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 bang. You've got these really yearning, sort of painful, painful intervals, or really comfortable, relaxing ones. It's, there's a lot of power held in intonation, the sort of fine end of tuning. Which leads me to auto-tune, which... <laughs> So I was originally going to actually be all sort of hubris, all, all, all thrilled that Autune is actually amazing, because it really is. Like, what it does is incredible. 
Um, but I was walking along the beach yesterday, and this was one of these that Vincent said, you know, the sort of, uh, inspiration moments. I was like, well, actually, I really can't, I really can't defend this. Uh, I can with my techie hat on, but with my music nerd hat on, I really can't. And so here's why. So autotune, it's got this very distinct sound. You know, it's, I think if we can, first of all, differentiate between a technical product and a tuning system, I think it's quite an important difference. Um, Autotune is a revolutionary product, but I think it is also, rarely, um, a revolutionary tuning system where every single note is a discrete reference point. There is no overarching concept of B-flat major. There, you can program it to do it, but as default, you have 12 discrete units of pitch, and each note is equally as important as the next. Nothing, there's no weighting, there's no particular musical concern for the leading note or you know, the rise, set, the major third or the major seventh. It is just a B flat. It is just an F sharp. It's a functional unit of creativity. It's a functional unit of sound. If you turn on Radio 1 or listen to Glee, you'll know it's got this kind of sugary, you know, it's, it's really sweet, right? And I, I've got this, this concept in mind. It's a bit like going to McDonald's for a burger. It's got sugar in it. It makes it very easy to assimilate, very easy to eat. You kind of want another one straight away. Um, you know that it's a burger. It covers the unit of burgerness quite well. Um, it's not great meat. It's not great food. But it does its thing really, really well. And, you know, I think there's, there's no particular coincidence that autotune is used in aggressively new music. You know, there's a myth that people don't like new music. The top 20 completely dispels that. They like new music that they can access. I'm convinced of this, that autotune helps this. It removes one degree of variation from the newness of a new song. The sound is the same. The sound of the voice from, I'm probably not going to name them just in case I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, between, say, the top five selling female artists in the US, hypothetically, um, right now, you could lift notes. You could lift a D from that song and this song and that song and that song, and they will be identical. They will be absolutely the same, but they'll have the same harmonic sound they remove the, the top bit and the bottom bit so that the pitch gets this really clean middle. You can instantly identify what's going on. And, you know, it's not, to be fair, just about cheating. You know, this, this has it changed how people write for instruments. It's changed how people write for voices. It's changed how people are writing music. They're writing different vocal lines. Um, again, if you watch Glee, uh, you'll hear a lot of fourths. Da -da that interval, you'll hear a lot of them. Uh, it happens to fit really well with auto-tune. It removes the need for a major third, minor third. It's not just a functional thing. It is a perfect interval. Like, it just works. And, and you hear a lot of these. And, you know, like all um, progressive and um, innovative tuning systems, it has quite profound implications on the actual output of that generation. Um, you know, like every other tuning system, Baroque performs, historical performance today. Are there any historical performance nuts in the house? No. Can I say this safely? Yes. Um, they're very particular about this. They really, really get into their tuning systems. And the whole concept of pitch, you know, being at 440 hertz is, is crass. And metal strings, it's, mm -mm, you wouldn't really do it. But, you know, the, the issue is that people are really vocal about autotune. They think it's doing something maybe worse than it really is. Um, you know, I, I have a, a thing with it that, you know, if we remove pitch, if we remove the expressive quality of pitch, we're losing one of the most um, abstract tools in our creative toolkit. You know, it, we're losing the ability to add human inflection. I think there's a very good reason you don't go to the National Theatre and watch the computer's text-to-speech voice recite Shakespeare. You know, you get, you get actors, you get people to really impart that emotion. And yeah, they get the words wrong, and they maybe rush through one phrase, or they uh, pronounce it, you know, pronunciation, not pronunciation, or they say espresso, not espresso. You know, the tiny little, but no one really cares. <laughs> you know, the tiniest little inflection, the depth, the, the great performers, the great communicators, it's, it supersedes that. You know, it goes far beyond the minutia of, well, that B flat was a little bit sharp or a little bit flat. It's, it's a detail. It's a nagging detail. Um, but it is nonetheless quite pervasive. And, 
that if music isn't about the, as Jennifer was talking about, um, if music isn't about, if it's about anything, it's, it's about, you know, communication, it's about implication, but I think it's about this. I think it's about the imperfect interpretation. Uh, you know, in the arts, we're always talking about there's no money left, there's none of this. You can, we, we've got, you get one performance, you get one interpretation of it, and there's a real sense of, you can limit that, you know, you can share that once. If you were there for that one killer Beatles concert, or that one amazing, um, you know, opera, the Royal Opera House, or this great show at, Co at, at um, you know, the O2, where you just heard it just click, that's the thing that we should be striving for. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not that it's an aggressively bad thing. It's that it is happening right now that the sound works for our cultural generation. It is something that we are used to. It's a sound we know. It's a tuning that the, the function fits its purpose. Um, but it's not the future. We often get roped into talking, I quite often get roped into talking about the future of the cello. <laughs> but the, the future of music, the future of pitch and tuning isn't auto-tune, but it is the present. You know, and there's a very fine difference. We assume these things to be, you know, the huge legacy, uh, you know, the, the lasting, endearing, enduring light. But actually, someone came up with this, and someone will come up with something else. I, I would contend that autotune, as a tuning system, as a sound that we are accustomed to, will have its 15 minutes, 15 years, whatever it is, of fame. But ultimately, the, the depth and expressive quality of, of imperfection um, and the identity, the real identity, you know, if you make pitch completely homogenous, why would you bother listening to music from continental Europe? Like, why would you, why would you care about having a, a Chinese harp? You know, it, that, because that is really out of tune for auto-tune. Like, it would kill itself trying to tune that. <laughs> Are you, seriously. Um, you know, but it's, it, beauty is in its imperfection, like the viola. The beauty is in its frailty. And, um, you know, where are the countdown? I got a bit carried away. The pitch has always gone up. Technology has always pushed it up. Gut strings go to steel strings. You can wind them tighter. They get louder. So we see pitch go up, you know, very subtly brighter, and it gets louder. But what I think we're seeing now is pitch deflation, not inflation. That if pitch is, and I hope you can agree that pitch is about perception rather than um, everyone being built with antaras in their ears, that if our perception of pitch is that there is this leading, this inflection, the, the, the freedom to take liberties with, with kind of minutia of tuning, that if that is then rounded down, if a major third or a major seventh is rounded down to just being the note, that that has, the, the perception is it's getting lower. It's no longer doing that bright, brilliant thing. It's now static. And I think that leads to a, a quite worrying trend in pitch deflation, which you know, someone can work out, but I don't think we've ever had to really contend with this in a profound way, because the, the brilliance, the volume, and the sparkle is now added somewhere else. It's, you know, EQs and compressors, it's volume, it's raw, make it louder, whereas the raw acoustics used to do that. The acoustics of a, a, a refined violin would make it louder, it would make it brighter, it would make it sharper, and we've now actually separated the two by joining, I believe, pitch and frequency. Um, final kind of thing to leave you with, if, if the analogies haven't been overwhelming, is to think about it like uh, carbohydrates. So um, if we think about a violist, or a, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly reading this one because I just wrote it, um, <laughs> uh, you know, a singer leading or leaning on a note, if that is objectively out of tune, the, the thing is that something like brown bread as a complex carbohydrate is ultimately quite good for you. It's a slow-release energy, it's got a long run, whereas a refined carbohydrate, white bread, spaghetti, you know, whatever, a chocolate croissant, brilliant, it's a sudden hit of energy, it's a sudden kick, and it's got no real good for you. You ultimately end up being hungry shortly after. And, you know, if we lose the ability to process uh, complex pitches and complex tuning systems, so like, like this, or, you know, like expressive intonation. If we lose that ability and default to perfection as opposed to aspiring to imperfection, if we lose the ability to process the complex pitches and complex intonations, then I think we'll be in a far poorer position, you know, and looking for that sort of frailty and, and the human quality 
of, of pitch. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Thank you very much.